You are now, you are now listening, listening to, to Renaissance. 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 So, 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 so. Welcome to the Renaissance Soul Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. And for this episode, I'm joined by indie soul Americana musician, singer, and songwriter Steffi James to discuss her debut EP, These Days. Growing up in the Detroit area, she helped kickstart a DIY coffee shop with her brother that also doubled as a music venue when she was a teenager. Since then, she has toured with the legend from Detroit, Anita Baker, when she was 17. She enjoyed years on the road with uh, musician Nikki Lane, opening up her shows and playing in her band, and has also been an assistant engineer at Dan Arbach's studio. Now making Nashville her home, she hasn't forgotten her soulful Michigan roots, but has been able to hone her skills in the musically vibrant city. During our conversation, we talked about her upbringing and how that influenced the making of this debut EP, and we go into a track-by-track breakdown of these days, along with the visuals that accompany it. So after a word from our sponsor, we'll get into this interview with Steffi James about her debut EP, These Days. Welcome back to the Renaissance Soul Podcast, and we're talking about Steffi James' These Days EP, and with me today, I do have Steffi James. How are you doing today? I'm all right, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. So, yeah, we're going to break down uh, These Days for uh, for the viewers, to, or the listeners today, and um, sure. first, you know, to start off, uh, you're, you know, you were born in Detroit. Um how long, uh, you know, did you live in Detroit? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I grew up there pretty much forever. Uh, born Royal Oak, Beaumont, and I still have family and everything there. But uh, I don't know. I was there maybe until like 2015 or so. Um, and I kind of already started touring and hanging out in Nashville a bit. So it wasn't like a like an exact move. It was kind of gradual. As I as I got more work done in there, or so, you know, it wasn't like a a hard date because I was kind of going back and forth for a little while. As I would get work in Nashville, I would be spending more time here, and it was like a gradual move. But somewhere in there, 2015 or so. Well, you know, uh, when did you first start going down to Nashville? You know, what was the reason why you were taking the trips down there? So uh, it's wild. I was I was touring with Anita Baker. And I was still living in Detroit and um, we were traveling around a bit and I was kind of spending time in different cities that I really hadn't previously. But the music scene down in Nashville was just really interesting to me. And uh, it felt like there was a lot going on and and stuff that I kind of identified with. Um, And it just kind of seemed like I felt a really strong pull to to move down there or down here, rather, you know, (laughs) so... (laughs) I'm here now. But uh, there was just a lot. The people were making records down here that I could kind of see myself making. And I just wanted to get involved and, like, meet those people, like, form relationships with those people and, and start working with them. And uh, just kind of go after it and go out and do it. And and so that's what I, I did. I didn't really have a plan in place when I came down here. Um, just happened. And it Yeah, and, like, as soon as it did, everything kind of fell into place. You know what I mean? It's, like, doors just started opening. It was, like, within the first week or so of being down here permanently, um, this engineer I knew from Detroit, a guy named Callan Dupuy, he was working with Dan Auerbach in the Black Keys on all their records, and he was like, hey, want to come in? And uh, I was like, I'm down here. I don't have any work. And he just kind of offered, you want to come to the studio and help me with this session this weekend? And I was like, oh, man, I'm so not qualified to work in a studio. Like, I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, no way. And uh, he's like, hey, man, you know, trial by fire. Like, come down and do it and see how it goes. And so I did. And I kind of fumbled my way through the session. But uh, by the end of it, he was like, cool, yeah, let's get you on the payroll. And then, And then suddenly I was 
working sessions at, at Dan R. Rock's privately owned studio down here. So, and then kind of one thing after the next just kind of fell into place. Yeah, you, like you mentioned that you toured with uh, Nita Baker, you know, fellow Detroiter. Go ahead and um, right. yeah, let me know how did that that opportunity present itself? Oh, uh, so I guess backing up even further, when I was 15, uh, my brother and I started this like DIY style coffee shop um, in Rochester, Michigan, where like we had no scene. There was really nowhere for us to play live music. Me and all my friends in high school, we all played music, <laughs> but we couldn't play bars. Like there was no scene, really. There was nothing. And what was so the name of that place? A, uh, it's called Desert Oasis Coffee Roasters. Okay. Everybody, everybody calls it DOCR now, kind of. But um, we started it up kind of with the intention of just hosting live shows. And, uh, and we were doing that. It kind of became like a cool little hang and, and developed a little community and open mic nights and just having musicians out. And uh, things started rolling. And then my little brother got into roasting coffee. And when that happened, it was like, it went from like small DIY venue to like specialty coffee. You know, he took it to like levels that we never really imagined. Um, and now it's three different locations and he runs them. Total entrepreneur, businessman, awesome. Nice. Super cool kid. Yeah. So he's doing that now. But anyway, um, those shops were open and running and I was playing there pretty much every night that we didn't have somebody else booked. I would just get up on the stage and play um, and kind of fake my way through it, to be honest, because it was like I never really played out before. I didn't know that many songs. <laughs> I didn't have that many originals. But um, I was doing that, and, and one night Anita Baker came in, and uh, and she heard me sing. Wow. Which was wild. Yeah, I knew <laughs> who she was, and I saw her there. So I'm like internally on stage just freaking out. Uh, so I'm like, don't mess up, you know, that's a need to make. I'm like, all right. Um, and she's just staring at me. Like she's sitting far away, but she's like squinting and she's staring really closely and, uh, not intimidating at all. Out. Right. Exactly. I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh, she hates it. Uh, you're like, you know, I'm screwing up. This is bad. And, uh, and then when I finished playing, she wanted to talk. And I sat there and I talked with her for hours after we closed. Just about everything from wow. like Glenn Campbell country records to like, you know, whatever, desserts, you know. And uh, it was really cool. And then from there, we kind of just, you know, she invited me out to some things here and there. And then um, when she was going out on the road, she was like, hey, talk to my um you know, my travel agent and, uh, see which flight you want to get on. Like, we'd love to have you come out and hang on the road. So that was pretty wild. You know, it's like, again, I'm like, <laughs> things just kind of happen and they feel like so random and, uh, pretty surreal. Right. Getting to, getting into your de debut EP with these days when, mm -hmm. you know, after, you know, being in Nashville, you know, picking up some work, you know, touring, uh, you know, getting this experience with engineering. Like, when did you first start, like, thinking about what, like, these songs that would uh, end up being on these days? The songs, they would kind of always been in the back of my mind, like, floating around. It was like a gradual thing. I had these songs, and I was touring as a sideman in other people's bands. And uh, I was I was writing along the way, but maybe not taking any of it too seriously and then um i went out on the road with this band called clear plastic masks and um the guitar player in that band plays guitar on on the these days ep with me and is like a really huge part of the project now at the time he was the one who was really like hey you should take your songs more seriously and uh you know record them like work on them he's like and i'd be happy to do that with you and for me at the time that was a huge deal because he's like my favorite guitar player anywhere and uh he was like yeah like i'd be totally be down to work on this stuff with you and that for me was when it really kicked into gear and um it's like yeah let's go for it let's let's work on them let's record them what was sort of the like your first step during that process when it finally clicked in your mind yeah let me take let me take this seriously 
So, you know, I knew that we needed, I mean, I had that guitar player, Matt, Matt Mann, on board, and uh, we needed to kind of put a band together, and he helped with that, but I knew we would need a producer and a, a studio um, and an engineer that, like, really kind of got what we were going for. You know, we didn't want to go in and just make something, give it the Nashville treatment, <laughs> you know. <and laughs> yeah, just... yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of about finding the right guy. And uh, through Matt Man, um, I got to know Andrea Tokic, who I had known as the guy that produced that first Alabama Shakes record and um, some Hooray for the Riff Raff stuff. It was just a bunch of really, really great records that he had worked on. And... I don't remember if we sent him the stuff or played it live for him or what, but at some point he was like, I'm on board, you know? And again, that was something that was like totally surreal to me. I'm like, cool, we're going to work with this guy. And so finding Andrea as that producer for these songs was kind of like a huge step. No. What do you think uh, Andrea brought to this project? Because like you said, you were looking for someone that really got what you were trying to do. Mm Mm-hmm. I think, you know, these songs are all, they're definitely um, reminiscent of a lot of the records that I grew up listening to and loved, you know, like I Motown records and doo-wop records and yeah, all this kind of older stuff that's really part of the American songbook, you know, like whether we listen to them or not, like our parents or our grandparents did like they were playing in, in houses across America, you know? Uh, and that's the stuff that I really dig into. And so they the songs are reminiscent of that, but, uh, I think we needed somebody that could take them into, uh, still have like a contemporary and really modern vibe as well, you know? And so he's not, when Andrea produces a song, he knows all of that music and all those old records, but he's not copying that. You know, he's yeah. really kind of producing sound in, in his own way. You know, being that, you know, Nashville is really like a vibrant hub for making music. And like you just kind of mentioned, like the the Nashville treatment, how, how did you go about like doing your own thing without being too influenced by you know what's going on in in nashville and was there anything was there anything that actually influenced you about being a part of the nashville scene that got like thrown into the you know the vibe of this ep sure yeah i think honestly something i really have going for me is is where i come from like coming from detroit it's the music and the culture and uh there's like a lot of diversity that maybe is, is lacking a little bit in the Nashville scene. And so I think having that background like really has served me pretty well down here. Uh, There are probably things, you know, definitely some Nashville things that I've maybe picked up and the way people make records and stuff down here. But I think just growing up where I did and having different things in my ears um, has been a big, you know, and I, I think I didn't recognize how much, like, how cool Detroit was <laughs> until until I had moved, you know, which it sucks Always. to say that, but it's kind of true in some ways. Like, you really see there really is so much culture and, and diversity and history. Yeah, we're kind of spoiled here, Detroit. So, and we just live it, you know? It just, like... Completely. We see, we see our heroes in music just walking down the street or in the in the clubs or in the bars or in the coffee shops doing regular things so we don't actually like equate them with being these at all times being these th- people who made these magnificent pieces of music exactly yeah, yeah yeah i mean the history is just so rich it's like really really cool but again i didn't really appreciate that until I was down here, I think. Who are, like, who are some of the people from back here in Michigan that really, you know, whether you know them or not, or just know their music, um, that really stuck with you and was, and is very influential in regards to the music that you do now? Oh man. I mean, obviously Anita Baker, I can't, Yeah, you know, I have to give her credit always for everything because she just, 
I mean, even knowing her records and then touring with her and seeing her live every night, I never really got over like how incredible she really is. You know, she would go out on that stage every night and still just blow me away. <laughs> and um, just also just had like this like grace about her um, and the way she would interact with her fans and, and her band and people. And that was like very cool to, to see firsthand, you know, to see somebody go out on stage and be like powerhouse like that. But then also the, the person behind it. Um, it's very cool. So her, you know, I can't not mention her. Um, obviously I, the, you know, the Jack White stuff, all the White Stripe stuff, um, was big for me. All the Motown stuff, Smokey Robinson is like, <laughs> to me, he's, he doesn't really get any better songwriter and vocalist, you know? Um, even guys like Jim McCarty who are still around Detroit and, and playing around. Like, you can go see somebody as incredible as him playing out around Detroit, and that's kind of insane, you know? <laughs> nice, yeah. So um, right now, let's get into the uh, actual songs on the EP. I just want to go uh, um, song by song and talk about, you know, anything that pops out in your head. Um, anybody who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anybody who played on it, if there's anybody, anything specific you want to talk about, uh, let's just talk sure. about it, break it down. Um, the first song on the EP is called These Days. Like, you know, tell me something about this. You know, what was the the, the story behind this song? Yeah, right on. That song, um, it's kind of one that I I had some of the verses and the, and the chorus is written to, and it's kind of just exactly what was happening whatever i was going through at that point i was like early stages of a new relationship where there's you know that part of a relationship where you're like you find yourself thinking about the other person a lot but there's nothing really defined yet it's still pretty like cool and, and casual and <laughs> um i don't know and i was on the road a lot and i had just written that song and then it wasn't really finished and i was already in the studio with the guys and I just started playing it and everybody kind of started playing it. And um, it actually ended up being one of our favorite things we recorded on that session that day, you know, and it was the one that we didn't plan to record at all. And we just kind of finished it on the spot. Like I didn't have the bridge written or any of the rest of it. And we just finished it right there in the studio. And, and like I said, it, it ended up being one of our favorites. I see like a running theme in regards to a lot of things that you're talking about where you're just like, you don't necessarily plan it. It just kind of does it. You kind of do it. And it happens. <laughs> it just happens. Like, you know, like how do you, how do you keep that sort of, uh, I guess, freedom with yourself and not, you know, I guess not be too, you know, picky about, you know, when you're going to do things or too regimented, have that sort of looseness in regards to your just living life and creating. I think you have to, I mean, at least, at least for me, I have to. You can't really expect anything ever, you know? Um, and when you think you have everything figured out, that's probably when you have it figured out the least. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, um, and I kind of have to be, if I, you know, if you try to plan things or do things super methodically and calculated, it just doesn't, I think people can feel that in, in whatever you're creating. You know what I mean? If it's If it's not genuine, or if it's kind of forced, that's, it just doesn't feel authentic to me. You know, I think you kind of have to let yourself just do your thing. And it's probably different for everybody. I mean, just for me, creatively, you kind of have to just roll with the punches, you know? Okay, the next song is Lost With You. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one is, um, that one's probably like, maybe the closest thing to like a love song on the record, which is funny because it's like totally not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like everything seems kind of fine on the surface, but then it's like pretty dysfunctional, like underneath, you know, and that's just me navigating relationships and, and life kind of as it's being thrown at you. Um, and that one, that track too, I should mention, I really love the guitar work on that, that Matt Man did, but also that's Jack Lawrence playing bass on that. He's the bass player in the Reckon Tours, 
we were talking about Jack White earlier. So um, Jack Lawrence, he's playing on it, and his bass line's really cool. And there's a really great singer named Kishona Armstrong um, singing on that track as well. All the backing vocals are her, and she's another powerhouse vocalist, like really incredible. Actually, you should look her up. Anybody listening should look her up <laughs> as well. She's great. Nice. The next song is Sin City. Yeah, Sin City was, so that was the, the first single that we released, which um, I totally didn't expect it to be the first single or consider it to be at first. And I actually dropped that one out of the live set, <laughs> like when we were playing <laughs> and our drummer would always be like, let's play Sin City. And I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. It felt like one that I got like burnt out on for a while. And then once we had recorded it and we had the record, it was you know, the team and everybody involved, it was like, hands down, it was like, this is the single. And we were like, oh, okay, it's the single. But that one um, kind of has some of the influences from some of the surf rock stuff that we that we really like, and some of that, like, Dwayne Eddy, um, Dick Dale guitar playing kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, and again, that's Matt Man on guitar. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, that song... It's uh, it's cool. It was kind of like the unexpected. It was like the underdog of the bunch and uh, ended up being the single. Why do you feel like you, you know, maybe didn't think of it as a single, but yet other people did? I'm not really sure. I think I wrote that one really quickly. And, uh, you know, it's one that definitely has a pretty defined chorus. And I don't know if to me if that felt kind of like kitschy maybe or if it felt... <laughs> You know, or like it was, like I wrote it and then I was kind of like, eh, you know, and it's one of those where live it's easy to maybe, for it to maybe come off like a little cheesy live sometimes if everything's not like just right, <laughs> you know, but on the record I thought we nailed it um, and uh, we, we were really happy with the way it turned out. But yeah, I don't know why initially. I, I really don't. When it comes to like songs like that or just like, all your songs in general, when you're recording them, writing them, whatever, what do you, uh, you know, is there any thoughts about how you uh, are going to be able to re uh, to perform perform them live? And what's what are those thoughts? <laughs> Not so much, actually, and there should be. I probably <laughs> should consider it more, you know. Um, a lot of times it just starts with me on guitar and then, you know, the production on that record, it, it's, it's way bigger, which is kind of how I always hear things in my head anyway. Even if it's me sitting down with the guitar, just playing the chords, I always kind of hear that wall of sound thing. Like I hear a much bigger production, but um, maybe I'm not always able to communicate that. Um, so you kind of fill in your head with what's maybe not there. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. It's a weird thing, you know? And then once Matt gets involved, so, like, I'll write the song or, like, have the idea, and then I'll go over to Matt, and once he starts putting his guitar stuff on, and maybe he'll throw in, like, a chord change here or there, it all kind of starts to make sense. Like, when you're when you're creating these songs, how important it, is it for you to, like, keep that sort of space there during the during the creation of it to be able to expand on it, to be able to fill in those gaps or even just leave the space there for the imagination. I think it's important. I mean, I, you know, I like records that have, you know, are like really produced like that and the whole wall of sound thing and the Phil Spector thing. I'm yeah. a huge sucker for that sound. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's kind of like, I guess just because that's that's all the music that's like stored away in my head somewhere, that's just automatically my approach. It would be, I don't know, it might be interesting to sit down sometime and do like a more stripped down, um, just like me and guitar arrangement of the songs, you know? But I think that these, these songs, I think they stand on their own, just me and a guitar as well, which is like a big thing, you know? Because you can have you know, a lot of production, but maybe not, maybe the song isn't fully baked, but I think with these, we kind of saw them all through. Yeah. So <laughs> we've got that going for us at, at least. Yeah. You can go back to your roots and perform them all at the coffee shop. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll do a, a, a coffee house tour. Yeah, when it's all said and done, you're like, I want my music to be a certain way that I could go back and just perform it at a coffee shop with just my guitar. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, which is really cool. I mean, and then still have it be, still have the versions that are like really big and, and beautiful and cool. But uh, yeah, still just be able to do it. Yeah, that's know, cool when you can. Uh, style. Yeah, it's cool when you can do that both. You know, you can have like the big versions of it, but like the the straight up like acoustic version can be just as like emotional or heavy or whatnot. For sure. All right, the next song on EP is Where the Sage Grows. Yeah, that song uh, was like kind of just a groove that we had at first. It was like very much rhythm section, bass and drums, just kind of playing that groove. Um, and I wrote the song over it. And uh, that one is another one with um, – that's Jack Lawrence playing bass on that. And I think he just – his bass line's so cool. Um, and there's this, uh, we have like a dual guitar part. There are a couple guitar parts layered on there. So that one's like it definitely built on a groove, whereas maybe the other ones were built on. Okay, the next song is, all right. Okay, the next song is uh, West of Juarez. So talk about that. Yeah. Um, that song, I actually. I had pieces of that song written for a long time. And then um, I was co-writing with this uh, songwriter, this guy named John Bettis down here in Nashville. And he, um, you know, his first band was the Carpenters, like Karen Carpenter, like all those really killer Carpenters tunes he wrote. And then he wrote, you know, Human Nature on the Thriller album for Michael Jackson. Oh, okay. And, uh yeah, uh, Crazy for You from Madonna and some Whitney Houston tunes. Oh, nothing Pointer big, Sisters. you know, nothing big. Yeah, like he's, he's you know, just written. I mean, the guy just like writes hits, you know. A few songs and, uh, here and there, yeah, nothing big. <laughs> and he's a smart guy, like kept all his publishing, you know, so he's got this big old house out Woo. in like a really nice neighborhood. And um, I would go out there and visit him and kind of like play him whatever I was working on. And... Uh, West of Juarez was one that he was like, this is a really important song. Like, you need to finish this one. And I was kind of dragging my feet. Like, it took me a long time to finish it. And sometimes I do that. Like, I'll have part of a song, and then I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'll get around to the rest of it, like, whenever, you know. And he was really, like, kept on me. Like, no, you need to finish this song. You know, this is an important piece of postmodern songwriting. And I'm like, cool, I don't even know what that means. But, like, <laughs> yeah, sure. <I'll, laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'll work on it, you know. And um, why do you think he uh, he thought it was so important? Like, aside from like what you just said, and you're like, okay, I don't even understand what that means. But <laughs> what, what what did he did he say anything else to regards to like why this was important for you to uh, finish? Um, I think he definitely thought it was different than the other ones, and and maybe like a standout in his mind. But I think lyrically there was a lot going on that I probably actually didn't and maybe still fully don't understand like sometimes we write songs and we kind of figure out what they're about like afterwards you know like we're working through whatever we're working through and then the songs kind of inform us after the fact like oh this is how I was feeling or this is actually what I meant at the time yeah just like a really totally weird thing but um I think there was a lot of that with that song and he's like no like you're navigating your place as like an artist and a creative like in this current climate like whatever is this whatever's going on right now you know and I was like huh okay you know well, I'll finish this song and uh it was hard it took me like months to finish it and um he has a couple lines in that tune so we we wrote that one together ultimately um but that's totally a song that we never would have I never would have finished or, or recorded if it hadn't been for John being like <laughs> you need to finish this and then um that one has strings on it too, which is really cool. Um, that's the Accidentals. They're also Michigan-based um, band. They're playing strings on West of Juarez, and that's the first song I ever got to put a string arrangement on. So that was really exciting too. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to for people to hear that one. I don't. Hopefully, it's not too heavy. Um, <laughs> but 
uh, yeah, we're happy with the way it turned out. I hope people like it. What was sort of the obstacles that were going on with you that made it so hard to finish that song? Oh man. Um, that's a good question. You know, it's hard sometimes to be like really introspective and right now, you know, especially there's so much going on politically and socially. It's like to focus too much on yourself or like your own art seems kind of like selfish almost in a way. Right. You know what I mean? Like there's like a higher call now. There's like so much going on and it feels like, you know, we all need to be involved in, in all of that. So at the same time, it's hard to be really focused on <laughs> your own stuff and hashing out your own, um, whatever it is that you're hashing out when you're, when you're writing. So I think for me that, that really plays into it. It's just all the craziness of everything going on right now. It's hard to sit down and be like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, write a bunch of songs. Um, and some people, for them, that's actually what they need. You know what I mean? Some people are like yeah. really inspired by it and write protest songs and like whatever. And, and for me, I kind of just have to write like when, when whatever creative thing strikes. You know what I mean? You know, um, yeah. And it's just even, you know, with this EP, we kept putting off the release date because I was like, I don't want to be promoting a, a record right now, you know? Um, like just with all the, all the, take any, any attention away from the news and, and any media that I think people need to see right now. Like I didn't want to try to understandable interfere with any of that. So we moved the, the release date back, you know, several times <laughs> and the single releases and everything and, uh, distribution and management, you know, it was like it was such a headache for them, but I think that was the smartest move. Um, it was really the only thing that made sense to me. Right. Yeah. There, there's been times during these, uh, you know, our 2020 that, in, you know, includes a global pandemic, you know, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests, um, mm -hmm. you know, right now there's a lot of uh, stuff coming out in regards to, um, you know, sexual abuse and abuse of uh, all types of natures in a lot of different industries. Sure. But, um, and yeah, there's times when you're like, yeah, this is probably not a good time to like release my art. But then when things start of sort of like, I, I say like become a, like flatten out a little bit, maybe become a little bit normal that we're, uh, it's normal that this stuff is happening. Like, mm -hmm. like people want to hear some new music, see some art that reflects the, the times, even if the art was made before any of this, sometimes we need need a uh, little reminder that you know there was life before this there's going to be life after this you know so it's not really a selfish thing to do to you know say that i'm going to be putting out sure. this music you know because what we're all trying to just swim in these very mucky waters of what's going on these days and mm -hmm. I, I think we all want to be able to have some sort of imp input of our own even if it isn't about the things that are going on Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you're totally right. People need art and music and even like a break from like whatever shit's going on in their, you know, in their newsfeed. You know, people just want maybe to, to hear a new record and just have a, a minute to like wind down and, and take a breather, you know. So you're, you're probably right. When, you know, when it comes to, a, you know, an EP like these days, when you, uh, when you sort of first listen to it, you know, you kind of hear the, I guess the, the Americana influence, a little bit of a country influence, but then when you like on the surface, but when you really listen to it, you hear the soulfulness of it. You hear like the doo-wop of it. Uh, you hear mm -hmm. all these different influences, you know, looking back as at this EP as a whole, you know, what, what's your thoughts about sort of like the different layers of the sound of this record and how it just like something that you really need to listen to to sort of get it all? Um, what do I, 
are you saying which part of it do I or do I think people need to listen to the all of it to get a sense of what it's about? Aren't better question is this like better question would be um you know, what's your thoughts about just have having just like all these different layers of of the sound of the record um instead of just having like maybe a, you know, maybe a stereotypical, like maybe Nashville country Americana sound to the fact that mm -hmm. it also, you know, digs deeper into all these different sounds that you are greatly influenced by. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I think that's just like a reflection of, uh, you know, everything I've, I've been around and it's like a culmination of like all of my own experiences and everything. I don't, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Nashville and I've worked with Americana artists and I've toured with, you know, a lot of people in the Americana, like almost country vein. But for me, like, that's not, that's not totally who I am. You know, I'm kind of like pieces of all these other things as well. So for me, there's really kind of like no other way to, to really make a record and, and represent what I'm doing without having all these different influences, a, a part of it, you know? Because it, it it takes like all walks of life and all different styles and and everything, um, and hopefully that's and it, that's kind of been a hard thing for uh, the team working on marketing with this because they're like, cool, what kind of record is it? Yeah, like <laughs> you know, like they're yeah. like <laughs> like to say it, it's not. They're like it's not a, a rock record because you go into the rock world anymore, and now that means like really kind of heavy or like alt rock or like whatever. Yeah. And for me, it's like rock and roll is, I have like a very different sense. I think of when I say rock and roll than like other people do, you know, I'm thinking of like rock and roll from sixties, you know, which it, it kind of fits with that stuff. But anymore, these terms have different meanings. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's funny. You listen to it and you're like, yeah, I definitely hear the, like a little bit of country influence. And then I talk to other people down here in Nashville and like, they don't hear that at all, you know, probably cause they're so used to it and so immune to it, like that sound. But, um, yeah, it's kind of a grab bag of all, all different styles, I guess. But that has been something that they're like, we don't, where should we pitch this? You know, it's not a singer songwriter record. It's not this, it's not that. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have a good answer to that yet. It's kind of, Right. I think that's like sort of a, a thing that like sort of a freedom that you're seeing more and more with artists where they're just mm -hmm. kind of like doing, doing, just throwing it all out there. Um, you know, of course, you know, your, you know, people's management and their, you know, publicity, they try to like figure out what it is so where they can pitch it. You know, that's understandable. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times I don't think it's as, um, there is as much pressure as there maybe was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago in regards to putting yourself in a certain label, because it's funny, like you'll have like a, um, you'll have a band like Twin Temples, like they're like mm -hmm. straight up doo-wop and everything, but people will throw sure. their, uh, their record like in the rock or metal section because, right. <laughs> because it kind of, it's weird. It's, it's this weird doo-wop thing, but it's like devil stuff and everything. So they just throw it with like the metal and, yeah, right. And metal people love it too. At the same time, it's just like it's there's like this these weird sort of uh, connections that people make, even though the you know the records might not sound exactly like these other things. There's things that mm -hmm. you know are transferable in between like certain certain genres, and that's what I liked about your EP is that it 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 isn't a straight up genre record. You know, it's all these oh, little. Thanks. All, all these little things come together and you're like, oh, 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 okay. This is like, you know, and you take a few times to listen to it and you're like, oh, this kind of sounds like more like a doo-wop record. You know, I like this one. All right, cool. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, that's what it's very like, that's what, that's what this EP does very well. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I hope, you know, hopefully it'll be uh, received well. <laughs> when everything was all said and done and this record's complete, you have these five songs mm -hmm. put together, you know, what was your like initial thoughts and feelings about it as a whole? Uh, I mean, you know, the record had kind of, this has been 
like years in the making, actually, because we started the record with Andrea Tokic at Bomb Shelter, and we're tracking everything to tape. And then I got this production deal in the middle of it that took like probably like a year out of like what just working on that. And then at the end of that production deal, we ended up with a product that I was like, I, I can't put this out. This just isn't me. You know, it was like, it, it was a different band. It was this different producer. It was all like just completely different than anything I would imagine for myself. They were my songs, but they didn't sound like me at all. And so, uh, and that was really hard to do to tell everybody involved, like, Hey, like we made this record, but I, I can't stand by, I can't put this record out, you know? Yeah. Um, it just doesn't feel authentic to like, you know, who I am and what I envision making. So I abandoned that project and then it's kind of like really bummed out about it. And Matt man was like, you know what, let's go back to Andrea's and like finish the stuff the way we started it, you know, when there's tape rolling in the room and there's like that magic in the room and the live band, let's just do that approach, you know? And, uh, sure enough we did. And it's like once, as soon as we were back in that setting with uh, like the right players and, and, Andrea like at the reins it totally came together um and then it's like cool I want to put it out like immediately of course. you know <laughs> and everyone's like oh like no like you have to be smart about it like let's put a let's put a plan in place you release a single at a time we promote it like do everything the right way but I'm like impulsive like I finished it and I'm like cool let's put it out yesterday yeah I, th yeah, I think everybody wants to do that they're like they get it done <laughs> they love it let's put it out Right. You know, and it's like, oh, I'll write more songs. Let's put these ones out and just like keep moving. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky to have a, a really good team and they're like very smart and strategic. And they're like, no, let's put a single out at a time and promote it. And you tour around this release. And and uh, that was all stuff that I wasn't really like I didn't really know much about, you know, like I could write the songs and make the record. But then uh, the like part afterwards like cool now what <laughs> yeah. you know that was something i totally didn't know much about and i'm like not super patient so it was like a kind of a hard thing for me to like just be patient and like you know release things gradually plan it out so yeah along with those things what were some other things that you uh learned about you know making a record putting it out even you know things you learned about yourself during the making of this ep um, man, um, I learned that I actually act like pretty well under pressure, you know, like when it's like a situation where it's like, cool, you have like one take to sing it right. And like, I could actually do it, you know, um, maybe better if I have one shot than if I have like unlimited hours to sit and like pick my vocals apart. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that was interesting, but also just the whole process, like, uh, collaborating with other people and trusting other people. Um, as a creative can be kind of hard when you've written the songs and then you're bringing them to somebody to, to bring them to life. You know, there's like a lot that could change in the process or maybe go a direction that you didn't see it going. Um, and you kind of just have to trust the people you're working with. And that's why I think it's important to find like the right people to work on a record with. You know, like I said, that that production deal, that whole record that I made that we like will never put out that was very much a thing of me like looking at it and recognizing, okay, this isn't, this isn't me. This isn't my sound. This isn't, um, and being able to say like being able to say that and be honest about it and not just put it out because people had spent money on it and it was done. And it's like, well, you know, um, I kind of really had to like stand my ground and be like, Hey, you know what? I just, I don't think this is the record. You know, yeah. so and then, like I said, going back to Andrea's, then then we got it. I think you just have to be open to collaboration, but um, and compromise even. But, you know, I I think the artist knows, like, in their heart of hearts, like what's what's authentic to them and, and what isn't, you know, and you kind of have to stand by that. What sort of the difference did you have in regards to what you were feeling in regards to, um you know, that, that project that you scrapped 
in comparison to uh, this EP? You know, just when you're playing those records, like what what was like the feeling that you were having with playing that that uh that project that would end up being scrapped? Ah, it's just like you know, um, it's just like very clean and and compressed and and sounds kind of like sounds kind of like a totally different band playing your songs and you're like it's like a backing track that you're kind of singing to you know like it didn't feel like all one like cohesive part you know what i mean it kind of felt like putting things together that maybe just didn't jive really the way i wanted them to but then and a lot of that you know wasn't done live you know it was done like in a really nice studio here in nashville and there were a lot of overdubs and everything whereas when we cut stuff at Andrea's, it's we're tracking the tape and the band is live in the room. So it's pretty much like mostly all live takes, you know, yeah. and we'll overdub some like organs or like keys on it um, and maybe fix some vocal stuff. But you're kind of really mostly just working off of that live take of the band in the room. And to me, there's like a magic to that, you know? Yeah. Let's talk more about that. Like, you know, talk about the studio sessions for the for the final EP that you would do. Um, you know, where was it at? Who was in the room? You know, what was sort of like the, you know, the process of everything? You know, what was sort of like going on in those studio sessions? Yeah, so it's like um, the studio we recorded at, it's called The Bomb Shelter. And it's here in East Nashville. It's actually like right down the street from my house. And uh, it's Andrea's studio. And it's all analog. You know, so everything is just track to tape, you know, and it's like all really old gear, which is awesome. It sounds awesome. You know, like yeah. um, you can hear the difference for sure. Um, and to me, that matters. Like, that's the kind of thing that I'm super into. I know some people are like, oh, tracking the tape. Oh, it's a nightmare. You know, like. <laughs> but I no think it lends well I, to I, the I'm music that you do. Tools. Like, because like the music that you do is influenced by you know, older stuff. And that's how they used to do it back in the day. So like it really lends itself to your type of music. Completely. Yeah. So, you know, in in that studio, it's like from the outside, it just looks like this little pink house, right? It's like super unassuming from the outside. Um, And inside there's just all this incredible like 1960s gear and old tape machines. And um, so we, and it's like small, it's like a, you know, pretty small space, but, um, just like really cool and just kind of all about the vibe. Um, and so that's me and Matt Man and Andrea. Andrea's actually, he produced the record, but he also engineers it while he's producing. So, <laughs> you know, like a lot of producers, they'll just have like another guy engineering it. Andrea's doing it both at the same time nice you know he's like flying across the board he's like adjusting levels he's like it's kind of like watching a mad scientist at work while he's (laughs) in the room you know it's like super cool and then that like you know you kind of feed off that his energy a little bit you know because he's in there just like making stuff sound awesome and like you know drenching things in reverb which i love and then it kind of just like moves things forward in like a cool way everybody's feeling like pretty inspired and um, yeah, you don't necessarily have to wait to see how it sounds in- engineered. It like it's just like real time, so you can right, like yeah. just keep on moving. Yeah, I mean, his he's like while we're tracking, I think it ends up being like pretty close to what the, the mixes end up. You know, like it's not that far off with from like the final mixes we end up with. Um, and yeah, it was uh, like I said, just some some really cool players on it as well. Um, Jack Lawrence from the Rack and Tours, the other guys from Clear Plastic Masks, which was Matt Mann's, um, his like rock and roll band from Brooklyn. Uh, they all played on it a little bit. Um, a guy named Dominic Davis, who also he plays bass for Jack White and his solo project, Michigan guy. Um, Dominic's great. He's on that record. So it's kind of, we have different people come in and play like on the tracks. There's, it kind of switches up like from one song to the next, it might not be the same bass player, but, and again, that's just because we, we worked on the record over so many sessions over time, you know, but, uh, yeah, everybody's, everybody's great to work with. 
You know, what did you learn during that time just about being in the studio? Um, what did I? Yeah, I mean, I really prior to this didn't have much experience in the studio working on like my own stuff. You know, like I'd been an assistant engineer on, on a bunch of records and uh, like a runner and like an intern in studios around Nashville. But it's like a totally different thing when you're when it's your baby, you know, like these are your songs and it's your stuff. That's like the uh, the project. And that's kind of intimidating at first, I guess. But um I think you kind of come into your own in the in the studio, and especially as the songs come to life, you maybe like start to feel more confident about them. It's like, okay, this is the way it was supposed to be, kind of. You know, I mean, you can write the song, and as a songwriter, maybe still feel kind of insecure about it, and then when it all starts to come together in the studio, it's like, oh no, this is right. You know, this is cool. Um, and also just learning how to especially being like the only like female in the room, um, being able to be like, Hey, you know, I don't really like that. I like this better. Sometimes that's hard to speak up when you're in a room with a bunch of people who are like super experienced in the industry and like know what they're talking about. But you also are kind of like, you know, I kind of like this take better than that one or like whatever. Um, learning how to use your voice in the studio when you're surrounded by like studio guys, you know, (laughs) (laughs) is like, something that kind of took me a minute to like feel confident enough to be like, Hey, you know, I don't like this. Or like, Hey, maybe we could run that one again. I'm really not sure about that take, you know? Um, that was something for me that I kind of had to figure out. How did you sort of get past those insecurities, you know, and you know, what was the other people's reception in the room? Uh, I don't think you ever, I don't think you ever totally get rid of them. Right. Like, (laughs) As a as a creative or a songwriter, you're always of kind of like either comparing yourself or like, you know, judging yourself on this like maybe not fair um scale. But uh everybody that's the like I guess I was surprised by everybody kind of being pretty receptive to like and me having my own like opinions or ideas about things in the studio. Like nobody you know, you're like afraid to say anything like you don't want to tell them, hey, I don't like that take or whatever. But then when you do, people are totally, oh, yeah, cool. Like, no problem, <laughs> you know, and like maybe respect you more for, you know, um, having an opinion about it or having ideas. Right. All right. Let's move on to the to the, the album artwork for uh, for the uh, for the EP. You know, what was mm-hmm. the, the idea behind it? So, um, you know, I was kind of just ripping off of a lot of records that I like, you know, and they all kind of, um, many of them rather, not, not all of them, but I will have like a portrait of the artist kind of within some kind of framework. And, um, it's obviously, it's all kind of like old school, but like pretty clean design, um, and black and white seemed to be the way to go with, with that, just because the style of everything, you know? And then I'm like, for the EP, black and white. And then, I don't know, maybe on the album we go full color. I don't <laughs> I don't know yet, you know? But, like, that seemed to be a cool way to um, each of the singles. It's the same framework, but each of the singles is just a different black and white portrait in the middle. Um, and so they're all, they all kind of match like that. I'm like a little OCD. I liked all the... <laughs> all the matching singles coming out that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, there was like a Nancy Sinatra record that we were like, that I used as a reference for the graphic design guy. And then also this like Phil Spector greatest hits thing with that, um, that like diamond shape. And I was like, Oh, let's use that somehow. So we're, we're kind of taking elements of different things, but using them differently. But, um, you know, it's derivative, but not like a copy. Like the, the pictures that you use, you know, for the singles mm-hmm. and for the album, just for your, uh, just for your, uh, you know, the project in general, you know, what was sort of the, the visual representation that you wanted to come out um, in regards to for you and this project? Um, I think we wanted the pictures to kind of, 
do a good job of reflecting obviously like what the what the record's like but a lot of it is like it's kind of uh it's a kind of a tough record you know but it's still you know it's not like a super like flowery uh like really feminine record you know like any kind of like chick record it's kind of different than that and we kind of wanted the photos to be like you know, maybe look like I have a, like a little bit of an attitude, but I, I don't. I mean, obviously, right? But <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to, to be a, maybe a little bit edgier than like what, what you might expect, um, especially like in the, in the Americana genre, you know? Right. But still, still classic, like still maintain the uh, kind of like classic old school look um, without being too soft. When, you know, to kind of uh, start winding down uh, this interview, you know, when mm-hmm. it comes, to, like, now that this this record is done, um, it's, you know, it's, it's out there, it's, you know, a part of the world, you know, what's your thoughts about, you know, the record as a whole and what you hope that, that your listeners get out of it? Um. You know, obviously it's like very strange times right now. It's pretty uncertain as far as like, like I'd love to be out on the road touring the record like crazy right now. But, you know, uh, (laughs) with everything going on, it's kind of like touring is not really happening. Um, But I think I I would love for it to reach as as many people as it can and, and for people to hear it and maybe... Uh, like recognize and identify with some of those influences that are in there, but still um, appreciate it as it's, as its own thing. And like have a record that like, you know, we're um, we have it pressed on vinyl, which to me has been like a dream forever. It's like, man, I want one of my records pressed on vinyl, you know? Nice. Um, But just the idea that that record is out there then, and it'll kind of just be there forever. And maybe like years from now, some kid will find it and be like, Hey, this is, these songs are pretty cool, you know? Who are these people? <laughs> you know, that to me, that's like a, a cool concept that that can happen and it's it's out there in the world for, for anybody to pick up. And to, you know, kind of wrap things up, like when you look at the journey that you've taken, you know, from being this uh, artist that would, you know, play at the coffee shop into mm-hmm. where you're at right now, this record is out, you know, what's your thoughts about that journey? You know, how, you know, how has making this record, you know, changed you or influenced you or, you know, defined you in any way? I think uh, the journey, that part of it is like, I think it's so unpredictable and you can't really like see it coming for yourself, you know, and it's like, things happen when you're working hard, but maybe start to feel like, Oh man, like, is, is this all a waste of time? Like, is this ever gonna, and then like a door will open, you know, um, that, so, so that the whole journey is kind of like, (laughs) it can be kind of defeating, but then something happens and and it leads way to something else in ways that maybe you don't expect. Um, I don't know if, if that kind of answers. <laughs> I'm trying to think about the second half of your question now. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. So, um, no, it's been good talking with you. Uh, I'm really, uh, yeah. you know, excited about the e- the EP. Um, Thank you. The EP is called These Days from uh, Steffi James. Uh, where can people go online to get more information about uh, you and the new record? Yeah, so the record is um, it's on all the streaming platforms, whichever one you use, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. I, there are so many that I don't even, like, know. I see them listed, and I'm like, what is that one? What is Deezer? You know, like, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the socials. Uh, there's a Facebook page. Um, Instagram, I probably keep, like, the most up-to-date. Um and uh, a website as well with any any touring info. If if we ever get to leave our houses and tour again, that is uh, that'll all be up there on the website. Thank you for listening to the Renaissance Soul podcast. 
Hosted and produced by myself, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. Empowered by Anchor at anchor.fm slash renaissance soul. Renaissance soul theme music provided by Steve O. You can find more of his productions at imsteveo.bandcamp.com. And that's E-Y-E-A-M-S-T-E-V-E-O.bandcamp.com. Renaissance Soul is available on all streaming platforms. Please rate and review on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you want to support Renaissance Soul, please consider pledging via Patreon at patreon.com slash fresh the word. Follow Renaissance Soul on social media on Instagram at Run Soul Podcast and on Twitter at Run Soul Pod. And join the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash fresh the word. And for more information on Renaissance Soul, visit freshthepodcast.com. Thank you for listening and your support. Goodbye and good night. Renaissance, Renaissance. 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 Renaissance.